sending and yes we are live so our wonderful tech guy here jeremiah is going to be taking off in a minute here he's got some uh uh other plans that he has to attend to and uh so i'm going to be introducing um our speaker today a uh, very very briefly because most of you know her <laughs> it seems like you know her it's very interesting um so anyway uh violetta has completed a phenomenal program uh on the bob and then she did one on baha'u'llah and then this is the one that she's doing on abdul baha and there's lots more to come um and this is this program is being presented by three institutions working together uh, the institution that you're seeing right now uh in action uh, is is the clear water baha'i center that that is doing the technology for us at the moment um although this is actually my zoom account that is uh zooming the class and uh, I'm up, uh, so Clearwater, Florida is in Florida, near Tampa. So that's where they're located. Then uh, our speaker is currently in the Congo. Uh, wh what is the name of this country at the moment? I know it's had it had various names. Um, is it uh, this the name has always been Congo? the Republic of Congo. This is the Republic the of Congo. Republic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. the republic of congo um and um um and then uh, i'm up in a tiny town in the gold mining area of california um and i'm running a school up here called the firm foundation academy and then the third partner in this endeavor is called the desert rose baha'i institute which was started by a group of people um, in honor of Bill Sears and, and General Lai, two wonderful hands of the cause who lived their last days in the vicinity of the school. And uh, the school is um, a wonderful residential facility and they're also going to have some Zoom classes in the not too distant future. So, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Violetta, and she's going to take it from here. Um, Violetta, I'm sorry. Before you start, I need to mute everyone, so you'll need to unmute yourself. I apologize. So. Are you there, Violetta? Yes. So is Peter introducing me or not? Uh, or did I Peter think he, he, unfortunately, I think he had a connection issue. Oh, so. Okay, all right. Yeah. Listen, guys, every, this is the introduction. <laughs> Hi, I'm Violetta, and I'm going to be presenting the second day of the extraordinary life of Abdul Baha today. That's the introduction. So yesterday we stopped at the uh, Samsun, the last leg of the journey in the exile from Baghdad to Istanbul. And Baha'u'llah had uh, boarded a steamer with his family and they had arrived in Constantinople and we're going to see the arrival now. So this is the 16th of August, 1863, two and a half days after boarding the steamer, Baha'u'llah arrives in Constantinople on August 16th, 1863, the baggage and the horses are unloaded and the Holy Family settles into a government guest house where they stay for 15 days. On the ground floor of this inn, there is a pleasant vast room which Abdul Baha visits every day. This is a beautiful panorama of the city of Constantinople, also known as Istanbul in the late 19th century, when Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and the rest of the Holy Family arrive. So early September, 1863, approximately, the Holy Family settles in Istanbul. And here you have the Fatih Mosque, one of the most well-known mosques of Istanbul, the mosque of Sultan Muhammad, sometime in the late 19th, early 20th century. 
About two weeks after their arrival, the Holy Family moves out of the government apartments into a stately house, which they rent. During the sojourn in Istanbul, Baha'u'llah visits the mosque of Sultan Muhammad, this mosque, for the noonday prayer. As you know, both Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha visited mosques on Fridays for the noonday prayer, a tradition which was voluntarily broken by Shori Effendi, because we were now in the formative age of the faith and no longer the heroic age. So this mosque is now called the Fatih Mosque. And Fatih means the father of conquests. So it's still the Sultan Muhammad II mosque. In Istanbul, Baha'u'llah calls on no one, but visits the mosque and the bathhouse. People come to Baha'u'llah and he converses with them. But in the winter of 1863, two months later, three months later, a new exile. This is an engraving of Edirne around 1880. Four months later, after their arrival, the Ottoman government informs the Holy Family that they are to be banished a third time, this time to Edirne at the ends of the Ottoman Empire, all the way in Europe. In the middle of the coldest winter they have seen in 40 years. Their journey lasts 12 days between the 1st and the 12th of November of December 1863. I've called this story No Abasement on Earth Can Compare. This is the bridge at Buyu Çekmece, Turkey where Baha'u'llah and his companions crossed on their way from Istanbul to Constantinople. The arduous journey to Edirne lasts 12 days and takes place during the coldest winter in four decades. Abdu'l-Baha's feet and hands are once again frozen with frostbite during this ordeal the cruelty of which Baha'u'llah himself later testifies in heartbreaking detail in the Suri'i Muluk. And so this is holy word. This is the real words of Baha'u'llah in the star tablet, the Suri'i Muluk, the tablets to the kings and queens. Know then that what, when we came unto thy city, Istanbul, at thine own behest. Remember, Baha'u'llah was invited to Istanbul. They didn't say he was exiled. And entered therein with conspicuous honor. They expelled us, however, from thy city with an abasement with which no abasement on earth can compare. If thou be of them that are well informed, they made us journey until we reached the place, Adrianople, which none entereth except such as have rebelled against the authority of the sovereign, which was not the case for Baha'u'llah and the Holy Family, and such as are numbered with the transgressors. All this notwithstanding, that we had never disobeyed thee, though it be for a single moment, for when we heard thy bidding, we observed it and submitted to thy will. In dealing with us, however, thy ministers, he is addressing directly the Ottoman Sultan, thy ministers neither honored the standards of God 
and his commandments, nor heeded that which hath been revealed to the prophets and messengers. They showed us no mercy and committed against us that which no one among the faithful hath ever wrought against his fellow, nor any believer inflicted upon an infidel. God knoweth and is a witness unto the truth of our words. When they expelled us from thy city, they placed us in such conveyances as the people use to carry baggage. And the like, such was the treatment we received at their hands, shouldst thou wish to know the truth. Thus in the depth of winter, we were constrained to make our abode in houses wherein none dwell except in summer. It was a short journey of 12 days, but it must have felt interminable because it was the most terrible experience of travel until then. This is Baba Iski in Turkey in the 1930s, one of the stops on the 12 day journey. And Bahi Hanum would later state that the journey to Adrianople was the most terrible experience of travel thus far had. It was the beginning of winter and very cold. Heavy snow fell most of the time that they traveled and destitute are, were we of proper clothing or food. It was a miracle that we survived it. We arrived at Adrianople all sick even the young and the strong. My brother again had his feet frozen on this journey, my brother being Abdul Baha. So this is a small map of the journey. Um, you see it was about 274 kilometers. That's probably 150 miles. And here are some of the stops. Of course, as usual with these maps of journeys, there were many, many more stops than these. As you see, this there is a quite a lengthy uh, journey here between Salvari and Birkas and Ludeburgas. So, Dirne, Adrianople. This is, uh, they arrive on the 12th of December, and between the 12th of December, 1863, and spring of 1864 is the story of a very bitter winter. And this is the mosque of Sultan Salim in Edirne. The exile's first three days are spent in a caravanserai outside Edirne. After being moved into a summer house, remember in the coldest winter in four decades, unsuited for the bitter cold, they are moved again. The greatest holy leaf remembers early nights in Edirne when the vermin would make it impossible for anyone to sleep. Abdul Baha lights a lamp which scares the critters away and tries to lift his family's spirits by singing and by laughing. Three houses are rented, one for Baha'u'llah, another one for the friends, and a third house for Mirza Musa. The horses are brought to the house of the believers as it is equipped with a stable. No one in the family has proper winter clothing and the weather is so icy that all the town springs froze over. Baha'u'llah remains in the house until spring during this time, Abdul Baha visits the believers every day at noon and one day informs them that Baha'u'llah directs them to find a larger house so they can be together. After a long search, a suitably spacious house is found across from the mosque of Sultan Salim. So across from this mosque. 1864 to 1868, what happens during these four years with the covenant breakers? They rear their head again. This is a graphic uh, of pure evil, just trying to represent the assassination attempt 
in uh, abstract art. The scheming of the covenant breakers intensifies throughout these four years until about a year and a half or two years into their stay, Mirza Yahya attempts to assassinate Baha'u'llah by poisoning him. Shori Effendi leaves us with a powerful description of their treason in God Passes By. The monstrous behavior of Mirza Yahya, one of the half-brothers of Baha'u'llah, the nominee of the Bab, and recognized chief of the Babi community, brought in its wake a period of travail which left its mark on the fortunes of the faith for no less than half a century. So between 1864 and 1868, when they leave Edirne, Abdu'l-Baha is 24 years old, and this is a photograph of Abdu'l-Baha during this time. The photograph shows also his knees all the way to his feet and the carpet on which the chair is placed. But I'm going to leave the photograph right here. It is in Edirne that Abdu'l-Baha enters adulthood officially. He is now known among the believers as the master, Sarkar Akka, and by the general population in Edirne as Abbas Effendi, Effendi meaning sir, Sir Abbas. And you remember that his name Abbas means lion. Abbas Effendi is how Abdul Baha is going to be known to the non Baha'is for the rest of his life until his death in Ottoman Palestine, current day Israel. According to the greatest holy leaf during the Adrianople years, Abdul Baha has, as has been the case for several years, become the chief dependence and comfort of the entire family. She continues with a beautiful description of Abdul Baha in his mid twenties. These are the words of the greatest holy leaf from the book, The Master in Akka. He had from childhood a remarkable self-sacrificing nature, habitually yielding his own wishes and giving up whatever he had to his brothers and sisters, keeping nothing for himself. He was always gentle, never became angry and never retaliated. The life we were living afforded constantly recurring occasions for the exhibition of these qualities of his character and his unceasing efforts did a great deal to make its conditions endurable for the other members of the family. For the poor also, he had been very tender hearted and destitute as we were, he was always contrived to find something to give others who were in greater want. During these four years in Edirne, Abdul Baha learns to speak fluent Turkish. He endears himself to everyone, high and low alike, Babis, Baha'is, Muslims, and others. He teaches everyone and is widely known as the master. Among his friends is the governor of Edirne, who enjoys Abdul Baha's religious discourses and frequently invites the master to his palace. At times when Abdul Baha cannot visit, the governor himself comes to Abdul Baha. When Abdul Baha receives the order, when the governor receives the order for a banishment to Akka, the governor, so affected by this news, is unable to deliver the news in person and gives it to his subordinates and writes a letter of apology to Abdul Baha, leaves the city temporarily, stating, I cannot see this dreadful thing happen. In the earliest photographs we have of Abdul Baha from his time in Edirne, we see a noble young man with perfect features and jet black hair under a snow white Taj. At some point between 1864 and 1868, Baha'u'llah reveals the Suri Ghusna, the tablet of the branch, first intimations of the station of Abdul Baha. The most emphatic statement that Baha'u'llah makes during these years in Edirne is a, a few sentences here 
in the Suri i Ghusn itself. If you want to hear this tablet in the original Arabic with English subtitles, you can go to the Utterance Project. You'll find it easily if you look for branch, tablet of the branch. And these are the words of Baha'u'llah in the Suri i Ghusn, which was published in Days of Remembrance, which you can find on the Baha'i Reference Library. There hath branched from the Sujatul Muntaha this sacred and glorious being, this branch of holiness. Well is it with him that hath sought sh his shelter and abideth beneath his shadow. Verily, the limb of the law of God hath sprung forth from this root, which God hath firmly implanted in the ground of his will, and whose branch hath been so afflicted, uh, uplifted as to encompass the whole of creation. Also during these four years, four and a half years in Adrianople is the revelation of Baha'u'llah. And in fact, more specifically, the beginning of the proclamation of Baha'u'llah. As you see here in this little infographic, the proclamation has three stages. The stage one was in Baghdad to the Babi followers in April, 1863. The middle stage is stage two. From 1865 onwards, Baha'u'llah proclaims to the Babi communities of Edirne, Baghdad, and Tehran, and Persia. And the third stage of Baha'u'llah's proclamation is the open proclamation to the peoples and rulers of the entire world between 1868 and actually 1873, not 1870, because the Kitabi Akdas contains a portion of proclamation and it was revealed in 1873. Sorry. So for the four years in Adrianople are fruitful years, despite the machinations of the covenant breakers, which are unceasing. Baha'u'llah publicly proclaims his mission to the world in Edirne, and an unprecedented stream of very significant tablets are revealed during this time. Abdul Baha is occupied day and night in transcribing these tablets during the four years in Edirne. In Adib Tahirzadeh's majestic Revelation of Baha'u'llah, Volume 2, we can glean from the table of contents a partial list of some of the works revealed by Baha'u'llah during this period. And I'm going to just show them to you here. The Suri Ashab, the Tablet of Ahmad in Arabic, the Lahi Ahmad in Persian, the Lahi Baha, Lahi Ruh, Lahi Layatul Quds, Suri Dam, the Suris of the Hajj, which is the Suris of pilgrimage, Lahe Nasir, Lahe Khalil, Lahe Siraj, Suri Ibad, Lahe all of these. And at the end, we have the Suri Muluk, the Lahe Sultan, the tablet to the Ottoman Sultan, the first tablet to Napoleon III, the Kitabi Badi, the Suri I Ghusn, and the Suri I Rais to the Prime Minister of the Ottoman Sultan. Now, something really interesting happens in 1864 to 1868. Of course, we don't have a precise date. It's a very beautiful photograph, panorama of Edirne from 1922. Sometime between the ages of 19 and 24 years old, Abdul Baha composes at the request of Baha'u'llah a extraordinary 11,000 word commentary on the sacred hadith, I was a hidden treasure, for a Sufi leader who had asked Baha'u'llah, who then delegated to Abdul Baha, and Abdul Baha revealed a masterpiece. We are very lucky to have a small portion of this masterpiece translated into English by the Research Department of the Universal House of Justice. It is the last entry in the 26 additional prayers revealed by Abdul Baha on their website, Baha'i Reference Library, and you can listen to it in the original Persian with English subtitles on the Utterance Project if you look for O Lord So Rich in Bounty. It is a poem. So I'll just leave it here. At the conclusion of his masterful 11,000 word commentary on the sacred hadith, I was a hidden treasure, Abdul Baha reveals a prayer in the form of a poem called, O Lord, So Rich in Bounty. And it is written in the form of rhyming couplets. 
And the first time we ever had this translated was in 2021 on the occasion of the centenary of the ascension of Abdul Baha. I really encourage you warmly to listen to it in the original Persian. And so here is a little description of the summons of the Lord of Hosts, uh, the, the tablets to the world's religious leaders. Now, some of the, this is the entire summons, but only some of the tablets here were revealed in, in, uh, in, oh no, that, you know, the Lahi Sultan earlier, is not actually for the Ottoman Sultan. The Lahi Sultan is actually the tablet to Nasruddin Shah. My apologies about that. The, the, these are the five monarchs who are included in the um, Suri'i Muluk, the, that beautiful book that was published by the Universal House of Justice called The Summons of the Lord of Hosts that contains also additional tablets to other rulers. The five tablets that were sent out under the Sur Suri'i Muluk, that actual summons to the Lord of Hosts, are these five uh, kings and queens. Pope Pius IX, Napoleon III, the second tablet to Napoleon III, Tsar Alexander II, Queen Victoria, and Nasreddin Shah. Now, all four, all four of these tablets were revealed in Akka, in the Most Great Prison. One tablet was revealed in Edirne, the one for Nasreddin Shah. And um, the Suri'i Haikal was revealed in Edirne, but it was recast once Baha'u'llah was in the most great prison and had completed all the uh, revelations of the, or was in the process of revealing the other four tablets to the kings and rulers, it was recast and a conclusion was added. And that whole thing was the Suri'i Muluk. So the Suri'i Muluk is at the same time the name of a tablet that precedes it, and also the name of the five, five tablets of the world's leaders plus the Suri'i Muluk together. It's, it represents two things, a little complex. So in July, August of 1868, Baha'u'llah is banished a third, a fourth time to Akka. This is a photograph from October 8, 1933, which shows the ruins of the house of Izat Akka in Edirne, the final home of Baha'u'llah in the city of Edirne. And in the late summer 1868, the Sultan after many intrigues of the enemies of Baha'u'llah, further banishes Baha'u'llah to the place beyond which there is no banishment. He banishes Baha'u'llah to the worst place in the Ottoman Empire, the penal colony, the prison city of Akka in Ottoman Palestine. The Holy Family are informed they have three days to prepare for the journey but they don't know where they're going yet. They will learn this on the way. But they are told when they leave that Baha'u'llah will be exiled to one place. Abdul Baha will be exiled to another place. And their believers to another destination. And the believers, as the greatest holy leaf describes them, here, the friends crowded, weeping and wailing, refusing to be comforted. They determined to resist the separation. Great was the tumult. Many telegrams were sent to the government at Constantinople. But in the end, they were exiled. This is a photograph of Akka, Palestine, Ottoman Palestine, sometime between 1873 and 1878, at the time that Baha'u'llah was living in that city. So this photograph was taken at a time when Baha'u'llah was living in the city or in Masrai, in one of only two places. That's amazing. In the 1800s, Akka is the final destination for the most notorious murderers, highway robbers, and political enemies of the Ottoman regime. That is the place where the worst of the worst gets sent, in a way that reminds us of the Siat Chal. It is a walled city of filthy streets and damp, desolate, and deeply ugly houses. 
Aka, at the time that Baha'u'llah arrives with his family, has no source of clean water, and its air is exceedingly foul. It was the vain hope of the authorities that Baha'u'llah, along with his family, his companions, his followers, his disciple, and his faith, would quickly all die in Akka. Shoghi Effendi provides us uh, with an illuminating perspective on the exiles of Baha'u'llah. These are the words of Shoghi Effendi. Abdul Baha, after enumerating in his some answered questions, the far reaching consequences of Abraham's banishment, significantly affirms that since the exile of Abraham from Ur to Aleppo in Syria produced this result, which he has been describing as he's speaking, we must consider what will be the effect of the exile of Baha'u'llah in his several removes from Tehran to Baghdad, from thence to Constantinople, to Rumelia, and to the Holy Land. What are the spiritual effects of the movement of a supreme manifestation of God throughout these countries, these continents, over these seas? What is the effect of his movement through land, through geography? And so, friends, we begin part two. Part two, the most great prison, 1868 to 1877. This part covers the life of Abdul Baha from the age of 24 in 1868 to the age of 33 years old in 1877. And first, I want to show you a map. This is the map of the journey of the Holy Family from Edirne at the top in dark plum red through land all the way to Gallipoli. Here, the one, two, the third dot, the fourth dot. And then by sea from Gallipoli to Medeli, which is still in, autumn, in Turkey, and then Smyrna, which is in Europe. It's a it's uh no no this is still in Gallipoli but here he stops at Medeli is in Europe Medeli is in Greece so it's an island of Greece and then down to Alexandria Port Said where my father was born Jaffa Haifa and Akka so this is from the 12th of October of August 1868 to the 31st of August 1868 and it's 1,800 kilometers, and it's the reverse of the exile from Baghdad to Istanbul, because Baghdad to Istanbul was three quarters of the way on land and a quarter of the way by sea, and this is three quarters of the way by sea and only a quarter of the way by land. So it's sort of the reverse um, exile in, in a sense, but the, the, the ship conditions were completely atrocious, so it was, it was much worse. The Actually, the longest exile was the most pleasant from Baghdad to Istanbul because Baha'u'llah was very well treated all the way there. And then the worst was the shortest exile from Istanbul to Edirne. So the final exile, August, 1868, I'm just going to, this is a, going to be sort of a slideshow of the places where Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and the Holy Family touched on. So this is leaving Adrianople. This is a gate of the city of Adrianople and how the Holy Family leaves. Uh, and uh, Shoghi Effendi describes in God Passes By the inhabitants of the quarter in which Baha'u'llah had been living and the neighbors who had gathered to bid him farewell came one after the other with the utmost sadness and regret to kiss his hands and the hem of his robe, expressing meanwhile they, their sorrow at his departure. That day too was a strange day. Methinks the city and its walls and its gates bemoaned their imminent separation from Baha'u'llah. And he does note that both Christians and Muslims came to weep at Baha'u'llah's gate, but the Christians were the one who wept the loudest. This is Uzun Kupru, Turkey. 
This is the, I believe the longest stone bridge in the entire world. Baha'u'llah and the Holy Family depart Adrianople in carriages. They are escorted by an Ottoman captain, Hassan Effendi, and soldiers appointed by the local government. They stop at Uzun Kupru and Kashani, where Baha'u'llah resumes, as he is being exiled, resumes the first phase of his proclamation begun in Adrianople by revealing a significant tablet, the Suri i Rais, revealed between this city, Uzun Kupru and Kashani, the surah to the chief addressed to the Sultan's prime minister. On the 14th of August, this is the third stop. This is Kashani, Kishan, Turkey, um, where you see a view here with the uh, mills. In Kashani, Baha'u'llah completes the revelation of the Suri i Rais, the tablet to the chief, to the prime minister of the Ottoman Sultan. And of this journey, Baha'u'llah says, quoted by Shulgi Effendi in Bad Passes By, say, this youth hath departed out of this country and deposited beneath every tree and every stone a trust, which God will ere long bring forth through the power of truth. And again, when they reached Gallipoli between the 16th and the 19th of August, 1868, there are rumors of separation. This is a view of the Captain Mahalesi neighborhood uh, from, taken from the sea of Gallipoli. So it's like a land view of Gallipoli. The Holy Family spends three nights in Gallipoli without knowing uh, where Baha'u'llah will be banished and if the believers will be kept together, or even if the Holy Family will be separated. And this is a photograph. Remember I told you I had pictures of all the boats? Well, this is not exactly the boat, but this is the model of the boat that carried um, the, the Holy Family. It is an Austrian Lloyd steamer, and it is the type of class that would carry them from um, part of the way to Egypt. On the morning of August 21st, 1868, the Holy Family and 72 exiles board an Austrian Lloyd steamer for Alexandria. They stop at Medelli and spend two days in Smyrna, and they arrive in Alexandria three days later. Burdened by an overwhelming sense of distress and uncertainty about their fate and possible separation, and rushed by the Ottoman authorities, no one thinks of providing food for the coming voyage by sea during their stressful time in Gallipoli. Luckily or unluckily, one older servant on his way back to the ship realized this fact and purchases a box of bread. That's it. This with the ship's prisoner's rations, which were almost inedible, was the only food Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, and the Holy Family had to eat for five days until they reached Alexandria, Egypt. On the 21st of August, 1868, they stopped in Medelli, which is Mytilene in Greece. And this is a photograph of the harbor and the bay. Towards the sunset of 21 August, 1868, the steamship arrives in Medelli on the island of Lesbos in Greece. They stop in Medelli for a few hours, then sail on towards Smyrna. Izmir is now the name in Turkey. One of the exiles who had accompanied Baha'u'llah from Constantinople, Janabi Munib, he was the one who had carried the lantern in front of Baha'u'llah's Hauda from Baghdad. He had fallen ill in Edirne, but he absolutely refused to be left behind, and though ill, he wanted to be exiled with Baha'u'llah. His condition had now worsened, and he has become so weak that when he is brought aboard in Gallipoli, the captain insisted he be left ashore. So he was obviously very ill, visibly ill. The exiles pleaded with the captain to let Jinabi Munib travel as far as Smyrna, and the captain agreed. So they arrive in Smyrna on the 22nd, 23rd of August. It's now called Izmir, Turkey. And this is a beautiful view of Izmir and the, the ships. Um, because these, this is around 1870 that this photograph was taken. So two years after Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Bahá stopped there. So this is what the boats would have looked like. 
by two years, they wouldn't have changed that much. So the steamer reaches Izmir in the early morning of 22nd of August, 1868. And the devoted Jinabi Munib is so ill and weak that the captain speaks to the colonel, Umar Baik, the government agent who is accompanying the Baha'is to Akka and insists that Jinabi Munib be left in Izmir. The Ottoman officials allow Abdul Baha and his companions one hour off ship to take Jinabi Munib to the hospital. They lay him on the bed, they rest his head on a pillow, and they hold him and kiss him goodbye, and they're dragged away. Bahiye Hanum recalls that Abdul Baha left Jinabi Munib's side to go and buy him a melon and some grapes, and when he returned, he found the wise and modest Jinabi Munib had died, an event that will stay with Abdul Baha until the end of his life, because he will tell stories about it while he returns to Akka to Haifa in the 1910s. The ship that the Holy Family and Baha'u'llah are sailing on is anchors in Smyrna for two days and Persian residents come aboard to escort the new Persian consul and they are all oblivious of the presence of Baha'u'llah on board. They set sail for Alexandria on the second night on the evening of August 23rd, 1868. Now we see here something that we've seen before is um, they travel by night to avoid the heat of the day. Of course, August in the Mediterranean would be the height of, of, uh, of the heat. And of course, traveling on a boat, um, there were over a hundred people on this boat who the, what's the way to say this? The, um, the hygiene was very lacking. So traveling by night would have avoided the sweltering heat. And now the, the Holy Family and Baha'u'llah arrive in Alexandria between the 26th and the 28th of August. In Alexandria again, so this is maybe the fourth or fifth time that separation has been threatened. The family is so terrified that no one wants to uh, leave the ship to go and buy food because they're afraid that they're going to be separated or the ship will leave without them or that they will not be allowed to board again. So no one wants to leave. And there is an unexpected encounter with Nabil, the historian, the author of uh, the Nabil's narrative. He has been imprisoned in Alexandria. And he has taught the faith to a fellow prisoner, a Christian by the name of Faris Effendi, who becomes the first Baha'i of Christian descent. They both manage to get their letters delivered on board to Baha'u'llah as his ship is leaving the harbor. One of their friends is on a little boat and manages to get on the boat and give, give Baha'u'llah in person, the letters of Nabil and Faris Effendi. After reading parts of Faris Effendi's letter to the believers, which causes great excitement throughout the ship. I mean, the first Christian to become a Baha'i is a step forward in the, in the almost like the recognition of the faith. As the faith grows, the people who become Baha'i are now no longer confined to being Persian, and they're no longer confined to being Shia. They can be Sunni. They can be Christian, they can be from Egypt. You see, the faith is growing. So it's a deeply significant moment in the history of the faith when this happens. Um, and Baha'u'llah manages to reveal a tablet for Nabil, give it to the young man to go and deliver it. And then uh, Abdul Baha and Mirza Mehdi also give this young man who has a tablet from Baha'u'llah for Nabil and Faris Effendi, they give him uh, some gifts which include nuclear almond candy wrapped in paper. I love these details. Before departing, the only food the exiles are able to obtain are some grapes and mineral water. And their bread having gone bad, they travel towards Akka with hunger added to their fright and their grief. Just a little note, if you would like to hear the entire story in detail of Nabil and the first Christian Baha'i, you can uh, either go to read the part, I can't remember the part number, uh, the appropriate part number. 
Oh, part seven. Part seven in the chronology of the life of Baha'u'llah. Or you can look at the appropriate video in the narrated chronology of the life of Baha'u'llah. It's a wonderful story, and there are many, many details. So 26th of August, 1868, we are now in Port Said, Egypt. I will also say, hi, Dad, this is where you were born. <laughs> Uh, this is a view of the key of Port Said with rowboats in the foreground and a beautiful quality photograph at that. Very detailed and defined. They uh, leave Alexandria, the exiles leave Alexandria the day after they arrive and they make a stop in Port Said on August 29th, 1868. But of course, they stay on the ship on the 30th of August. They are now in Ottoman Palestine in Jaffa. And this is a photograph of Jaffa in 1916. So uh, on the 31st of August, the very next day, they arrive in Haifa, in Ottoman Palestine still. And all of the companions disembark, 70 in total, disembark from the steamer in Haifa and are taken ashore you know how I was telling you that they often travel by night to avoid the suffering of the, the, the heat of the day? They could have done this. They could have. But instead, they forced Baha'u'llah and the Holy Family to travel under the scorching noonday sun of full August across the bay, which took hours. And they are handed over to government officials. Bahi Khanum speaks. After a voyage of about two days, we were landed at Haifa in Syria, which is how they called Ottoman Palestine at the time. They called it Syria, the whole thing. All were sick from hunger or eating improper food. I myself was a healthy young woman up to the time of taking this voyage. Since then, I have never been well. So a few hours later, after being disembarked in Haifa, they board these sailboats, probably like the one we see here. This is a photograph taken in 1896. And they endure eight hours of misery under the burning, windless sun to arrive in Akka at their final destination. How much they suffered. And this is, in some ways, only the beginning. 31st of August, 1868, the Seagate. You have here on the left, there is an arched door in the middle of that span of wall that juts out into the water. That's the Seagate. And then on the right, you have an engraving of the government building in Haifa and the Russian pier, which was built in 1854. So I assume this is through which they enter, you know, and the pier, I suppose. So it's 1892 that you, 1895, you mentioned Baha'u'llah passed away at 1892, didn't he? Yes. So, so, okay. I guess, sorry. Yes. Baha'u'llah is, uh, this is the last place that Baha'u'llah will ever live. He will die here, um, 1868 to 1892. That difference of time, like 29 years, 20 years, 29 years, something like that. So in Akka, there are no landing facilities. The men are forced to wade ashore in the water and the governor's orders are that the women are to be carried ashore on the men's backs. Abdu'l-Baha will not have this. He will not have his saintly mother and his saintly sister carried on the backs of strangers. No, he himself jumps out of the sailboat and wades ashore in the sea all the way to the landing area and procures chairs so that his mother and his sister and the other women can be carried ashore in a dignified manner. 
There you see that Abdul Baha was so kind and so sweet and never lost his patience and never lost his temper and never got angry. But there were things that had to be done in the right way. And Abdul Baha would never compromise, not with the dignity of the women of the Holy Family and the women Baha'is. Baha'u'llah setting foot in the Holy Land is the climax of all of his successive exiles. And it brings him to the land that has been visited by all the manifestations of God of the past, the nest of all the prophets of God as you were. This day marks the opening of the last part of Baha'u'llah's 40 year ministry, as he will spend the last 23 years and eight months in Akka and the immediate surroundings of Akka. Entering Akka on the 31st of August, 1868. This is a street of Akka. Shows you the narrow, narrow street and the ugly buildings. As soon as they disembark, all the exiles, men, women, and children, are led by sentinels to the army barracks through the filthy streets under the curious eyes of the people of Akka who have come to see the god of the Persians. The massive door of the barracks is shut behind them with great iron bolts and sentinels detailed to guard them as if they were dangerous. It is very difficult for us today, a century and a half later, to properly picture in our minds the filthiness, the disgusting hygiene, the squalor that was everywhere in Akka. Baha'u'llah describes Akka in a letter to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Ere long shall the exponents of wealth and, ban and power banish us. So this had not happened. From the land of Edirne to the land of Akka. According to what they say, it is the most desolate of the cities of the world, the most unsightly of them in appearance, the most detestable in climate, the foulest in water. And so before we begin speaking in earnest about the most great prison, um, this is a map of all the four exiles of Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha, and the Holy Family, which includes Mirza, Musa, the brother of Baha'u'llah, who were with them in every single one of these exiles, and Bahi Khanum. Mirza Mehdi was with them for all these exiles beginning after Baghdad. From Tehran to Baghdad, he did not come because he was a baby. He came a few years later. So from Tehran, Abdul Baha is around nine years old when he leaves. And they arrive in Baghdad when he's about 10 until uh, he's about 19 years old. And then uh, he travels to Istanbul where he, be, he is 19 years, he is still 19. And then because it's only a few months later, he's also 19 when he arrives in Edirne up here. And because they stay here uh, five years, he is 24 by the time they leave. And this is their last exile here by sea. And so he arrives in Akka and Abdul Baha will be living in Akka, Haifa, and, and Akka and Haifa for the next 60 years, of, 40 years of his life. From the age of 24 to the age of 64, he will live in Ottoman Palestine and he will die there. So now we are going to begin the story of the most great prison, two years between 1868 and 1870, during which Abdul Baha ministers as much as he can to everyone who is there. We will not finish the Mot Chris prison today. We will just start it and we will pick up tomorrow where we, where we leave off. Uh, in the words of Shori Effendi, Baha'u'llah, wishing to emphasize the criticalness of the first nine years of his banishment to that remote city, has written, Know thou that upon our arrival at this spot, we chose to designate it as the most great prison, though previously subjected in another land, Tehran, to chains and fetters, 
we yet refused to call it by that name. Say, ponder thereon, O ye endued with understanding. So there is something about the episodes we're going to read that are coming up in this chronology that made Baha'u'llah designate Akka as the most great prison and not the Siat Shal as the most great prison. This was reserved for Akka. So this is something that you want to listen to with your spirit so that you understand the suffering that Baha'u'llah underwent and why he decided to bestow this honor on this dreadful place. So starting on Monday, 31st of August until Friday, September 4th, 1868, the first Friday after they arrive, the first week in the most great prison. The first night of their arrival in the barracks, Baha'u'llah is placed in a filthy, empty room. Later, he is moved into a room on the upper floor. Baha'u'llah's prison cell used to, this is before restoration that you see here. This is Baha'u'llah's prison cell before the restoration. See the ground and the, now it has been restored. But, uh, at the time in 1868, it was unfit for habitation. The floor was covered in earth and mud and plaster was falling off the ceiling, which is why I chose to put this picture because you can see plaster falling off in this picture as well. Baha'u'llah's 70 followers are crowded into another room. The floor is covered in mud. Sometimes in some parts of this room, they're covered in mud up until their ankles, so they cannot lie down in those places. The air is so putrid from the stench of the prison that the summer sun bakes the stench and makes it even worse. And it is so awful that Bahi Yehanum faints upon arriving. Because there's no drinking water and the only pool of water available to drink has been already used for washing, overcome with thirst and hunger, the children cry for hours. Breastfeeding mothers are unable to feed their babies. Abdul Baha returns to the docks to help the remainder of the exiles ashore. He has just arrived himself, and yet he has already left his family in the prison and already gone back to help everyone on board the ship. Once settled, Abdul Baha pleads with the soldiers to allow him to search for food and water for everyone. And he is rekindling that role that he had uh, during the, uh, the journey from Baghdad to Istanbul, where he was always looking for food for everyone. He's doing the same thing now, caring for everyone at the age of 24. The suffering of the exile intensifies because Abdul Baha's request is denied. And Abdul Baha does not rest that first night because he spends it consoling everyone around him and continuing to appeal to the soldiers. On the 1st of September at midnight, and they send over some water and cooked rice which is sent to the prisoners, but the rice has rotten, it's foul smelling, and it's filled with grit, so sand and sandy rocky bits. So only few of the exiles are able to actually eat that sort of rotten sandy rice. When they unpack their belongings, they find a tiny little bit of bread and sugar from Gallipoli, from the boat trip. And they send it to Baha'u'llah, and Baha'u'llah returns it. And he orders that it be given to the children. Abdul Baha sends message after message after message to the governor. At last, he sends them water and bread. But if it's possible, the bread is even worse than the rice. It looks as if they baked it and they mixed earth with the flour to bake it on purpose. So it's like a solid kind of rocky piece of bread, impossible to eat, break your teeth. 
At length, Abdu'l-Bah succeeds in obtaining permission for a servant to go out and purchase food under the condition that he is accompanied by four soldiers and under strict instructions and threat of death to speak to no one except merchants. Abdu'l-Bah has to live in a room on the ground floor, which used to be a morgue. The heavy humidity will in the air will affect his bones and his health for the rest of his life. A very interesting story here. One of the only times you're ever going to see Abdul Baha slap anybody, but it's very important to understand what is at stake here. So I'll tell you the story and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Sometime during this week, Ahmad Big Taufik, the governor of Akka, comes to the barracks for an inspection. He is incensed by the conditions of the incarceration and the fact that they're given inedible rations to eat. And Agha Hussein Ashchi, the young boy who was the maker of broth during the first journey from uh, Baghdad to Istanbul, he was a cook now in the household of Baha'u'llah, and he makes rude and insulting remarks to the governor in Turkish because he's learned to speak Turkish after four years, five years in, in um, Istanbul and Indirne. And when he makes those rude and insulting remarks to the governor, Abdul Baha instantly gives him a sharp slap in the face. And the message to the governor is clear. Abdul Baha has everything in hand. He's the leader. He will not hesitate to act with justice, even if one of his own steps out of line. That's the message. That's why the slap. And Agha Hussein Ashchi totally understood it. He even says it himself. He completely understands. So after the governor witnesses this, this uh, Abu Bahad disciplining, Aha Hussein Yashchi, there is a change in his attitude. He realizes that these exiles are not savages, that they are uh, refined people who have a sense of justice, a sense of propriety, um, that there is a leader, because Baha'u'llah could never have been, he is the supreme manifestation of God. He is not going to accompany a governor on a tour of the barracks. Abdul Baha is his shield. Abdul Baha does this now. He's 24 years old. And this, my friends, is where we're going to see Abdul Baha take over a lot of the responsibilities of Mirza Musa, who is only one year younger than Baha'u'llah. And so he's getting older. Soon, instead of the inedible bread rations and the inedible rice and the inedible, undrinkable water, the prisoners are given a daily allowance. But before we go on, on the 4th of September, 1868, the first Friday after they arrive, the sentence of the exiles is read publicly. It's now the edict of the Sultan, actually. His edict of banishment, condemning Baha'u'llah to life imprisonment, is read aloud in this very mosque, the Mosque of El Jazar. In the, this is a photograph of the mosque in the early 20th century. The exiles are presented as murderers thieves and political prisoners who corrupt the morals of the people. That's how they are presented publicly to everyone on the biggest day of attendance at the mosque on Friday when the edict is read. In the house of the Lord, they read this edict that's basically fabrication and lies. The edict states that they are to be confined to prison for the rest of their lives and forbidden from associating with anyone. And this is why in the last chronology that we read of the life of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah insisted so many times, I am a prisoner, I am a prisoner, I am a prisoner. Because what did they do? Four days after Baha'u'llah arrives, they read out an edict in front of everybody in town, because it was a small town, huh? uh, that he is a murderer, a prisoner, a thief, a political, you know. So then of course, Baha'u'llah would say, I'm not leaving this place, I am a prisoner, I am a prisoner. The edict was never canceled. It was valid until the day Baha'u'llah died. The only reason he died in Bahji with dignity and comfort in a mansion is because he was a manifestation of God and it is a miracle that he left the walls of the prison. When Abdul Baha hears the contents of the edict stating the exiles are to remain in prison forever, Abdul Baha responds by saying that it's meaningless and without foundation. Angered, 
the governor asks answers that it came from the sultan and he wants to know how abdul baha can describe this as meaningless and abdul baha just shows just his genius in logic and philosophy here he says that it's meaningless to describe their imprisonment as lasting forever because we only live in this world for a short while and sooner or later all of the exiles are going to live, leave the prison alive or dead and you can't be imprisoned if you're in the abha kingdom so it's meaningless to say you're imprisoned forever because our our earthly lives come to an end they are not eternal lives on earth if we live forever on earth you could say that we are imprisoned forever but because we only live a little bit on earth you can't say that we're it's brilliant logic very brilliant logic in the fall of 1868, Abdu'l-Bahá nurses the sick. This is a 1907 photograph of the Most Great Prison. Later, typhoid fever and dysentery break out in the barracks, and all the exiles fall sick except Baha'u'lláh, asi Khanum, an aunt of Baha'u'lláh, and two believers, and I believe also Baha'u'lláh did not fall sick. The exiles are not allowed a physician, but Abdul Baha has quinine. It's a bitter medication made from the bark of a tree and it's effective in curing malaria. And he also has something called bismuth. Bismuth is a soft metal that has anti-acid properties in his luggage. So he cures with these two drugs and with immense loving care, he succeeds in nursing all 60 plus exiles back to health with the exception of four who die during their illness. There is no one among the 70 exiles with as much strength as Abdul Baha because Abdul Baha is the mystery of God. He has superhuman strength and, and um, resistance. Uh, during this time, Abdu'l-Bahá alone washes the patients, feeds them, nurses them, and watches them recover. With the few provisions at his disposal, Abdu'l-Bahá can only cook a very simple broth and some rice each day. Gradually, Abdu'l-Bahá single-handedly nurses everyone back to health. Once everyone is out of danger, Utterly depleted and exhausted, Abdul Baha himself falls ill with dysentery, along with Asiye Hanum and the other three healthy exiles. Abdul Baha remains critically ill for some time until an officer, moved by the master's heroic caretaking of the prisoners, pleads with the governor for a physician to save his life. The governor consents and under the doctor's care, Abdul Baha's health improves. The physician becomes so fond of Abdul Baha during the course of treating him that he offers his services to him. Abdul Baha asks him to carry a tablet to the believers who have been waiting to see Baha'u'llah outside the prison. manner, the physician will convey Baha'u'llah's tablets to the believers and their messages back to him. This is a short little vignette. This is a photograph of uh, a public bath in Akka, a public bath. While in the barracks, Abdul Baha manages to render a great service to Baha'u'llah, a service that is also a deep expression of love. To bathe oneself is a great bounty. Near the army barracks in Akka, there existed a public bath which was in a state of ruin. For the sake of the blessed beauty, I had it repaired. It's a very meaningful gift because it's, it's the gift of cleanliness. And they forbade Baha'u'llah to... They forbade Baha'u'llah to um, bathe for quite some time. Uh, three months, I think. And that was just uh, extremely, extremely cruel. 
extremely cool. And here we have Badi, the teenager who was recreated by Baha'u'llah to bring the tablet of the Shah to Iran. Look at how he looks like he's 30 years old, but he must be 18 or 17 in this, in this photograph, but he looks like he's a grown man of, of 40 years of age. Look at that look in his eyes, that determined look, undaunted, unbroken, unbattered. That is the reason that the Shah sent his photographer there. This is the Shah's photographer who took this photograph of Bendy. The Shah wanted a picture of a man who had survived the torture without uttering a word. His name was Agha Buzurik Inishapuri, known as Badi, Badi meaning wonderful. He was a 17-year-old water carrier for the Baha'is of Baghdad. When 28 of his companions were arrested, he followed them to Mosul and he began carrying water again for them. But he is magnetically drawn to Baha'u'llah and he leaves Baha for Akka on foot with the attire of a water carrier. So a special type of clothing and a skin of an animal in which you put the water to carry it. Then you empty it when you arrive at the destination, then you return, you fill it up with water again from a source and you carry the water. Wherever Baha'u'llah was, if there was not a well, there was always a water carrier. And Badi was the water carrier in Baghdad and in Mosul. The distance between Mosul and Akka was almost 1,200 kilometers. And when he arrived at the city gate, dressed in his very humble, I mean, a water carrier is like a charcoal carrier, is like a, is like a thorn picker, is like one of those people who are like not important people, you know? So if a water carrier comes to Akka, you're going to let them come in. But if a Persian, a well-dressed Persian comes and wants to see Baha'u, you're not going to let them in because they look educated, they could be dangerous. But a water carrier, you let them in. Except what they didn't know is that on the planet at that time, Badi was probably the most important person outside of the Holy Family because he's the one that's going to take the letter to the Shah and they let him in because he looked like a water carrier. See what I mean? You can never judge people on their appearance. But once he arrived inside Akka, he did not know how to, how to contact the Baha'is. So he couldn't make any inquiries because he would have betrayed the fact that he was a Babi. So he just started thinking and thinking and he thought, okay, I'm just going to go to a mosque and I'm just going to sit and wait, which you can do at a mosque without being weird, you know? So he goes to a mosque and then all of a sudden, after some time, a bunch of Persians come and talk. And he thinks, ah, Persians talking in a mosque, these people must be Baha'is. So... Um, he, he looks a little bit more closely and he recognizes the master from the descriptions, obviously. Uh, obviously, if Abdul Baha, 24 years old, is in a mosque speaking to people, you're going to be able, even if you've never met him, you're going to be able to pick him out. You're going to be able to think, oh, that, that's Abdul Baha. There's got to be something about him. You see the picture of him when he's 24 years old, you see that he's radiant. So obviously, Badi knew immediately it was Abdul Baha. So he writes a few words on a piece of paper and just passes it to Abdul Baha in the mosque. And Abdul Baha is the one who makes the arrangements for Badi, this water carrier, to come into the most great prison and meet Baha'u'llah. Badi will have two interviews with the Baha'u'llah. During the course of these interviews, Badi is totally recreated. And he is entrusted with a mission of hand delivering the Lahi Sultan, the tablet to Nasruddin Shah. Many, many older veteran believers had longed for this honor, but Baha'u'llah had waited for two years for Badi to arrive to give it to him. And he said that in Badi, these are the words of Baha'u'llah, in Badi, the spirit of might and power was breathed. And that is why I chose this picture. There are two pictures of Badi. But in this one, I believe you can look at this young man and you can see the dead eyes of his torturers here who were branding him with a hot iron. They're even holding it in their hand. And you can see that he, in his eyes, you can see the spirit of might and power. Badi will tread alone over deserts and mountains for for four months, 
and deliver the letter. And finally, he will be tortured and killed in July 1869. Over the course of three years, Baha'u'llah will unceasingly praise his valor, courage, and constancy, revealing hundreds of tablets in his honor for three years nonstop after his martyrdom. Um, I am going to stop with this story here, which is the story of the two interviews of Badi with Baha'u'llah. Badi will have two interviews with Baha'u'llah. During the course of these interviews, Badi is entrusted with the mission of hand delivering the tablet to Nasruddin Shah, the Lauhi Sultan. I'm sorry, I just read this. I'm gonna read it again because it's just so wonderful. Many older veteran believers have longed for this honor, but Baha'u'llah waited for the arrival of this youth whom he said that in him, the spirit of might and power was breathed. There you go. So this is the end of the storytelling for today. Peter Terry, if you would unmute yourself. Um, Peter Terry, thank you. So, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, Peter Terry is going to close off the evening and then stop the recording. And then we're going to have a conversation which he is going to moderate. The only thing that I probably uh, do not know how to do yeah. is how to turn off the meeting because... Oh, don't, oh no, uh, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, Jeremiah is going to do it. Oh, he's going to do it. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's but fine. Peter, go ahead and just close out and I'll handle the technical. So how do I close out? I just... Just uh, yeah, you say tomorrow. Well, I'll do it for today. Oh, oh, <laughs> tomorrow, mean, we're going to see each other at the same place the at the same tomorrow, time. Oh, and uh, tomorrow, thank you so yeah, much for being right. present today. That's what you want me to do. All right. Well, see, Violetta knows how to do this a lot better than I do. So, yes, I, um, we're going to continue to do these sessions through the 1st of October. Um, and my so Peter, we, listen, I, I have to say this. We don't know when this is going to end because we don't know how long this is going to take. And this is a very, very long chronology. It's twice the size of the chronology of the Bob, which took eight days. This is 561 pages. The Bob was 260 pages. So we'll finish when we finish. Um, it will be beginning of October, definitely. But and if you can't come to the sessions, put your email in the chat and I'll send you the video for the day that you missed. Um, but we don't know when it's going to end. So. Yes. OK, it so will be I'm, definitely, I'm definitely, definitely, definitely less than 18 days. Definitely less. Uh, yes. And 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 by the way, this is. um. This is uh, the hallmark of a um, an honest historian, because the honest historian won't tell you uh, that you could package things. You really can't really package them because when you start talking about them, um, it the story carries you away. It carries you to another place. It has to, you know, otherwise, what's the point? Why would we do this at all? Mm -hmm. and, and so we're and and the other thing is it will carry you away and then you'll you'll have a million questions <laughs> and maybe you'll remember to ask one of them. Um, <laughs> um, so this is your uh, this is your opportunity now to um, to we have ask to stop questions the uh, that might hurt you. I've requested um, that the conversation only be with those who are actually present during the the, yes, the exactly. live uh, storytelling so that's why we always end our recordings before the uh, the, the discussion time so if it looks like we, i don't know what i'm doing it's because i don't know what i'm doing um <laughs> this was you're doing fine I'm doing it, and i didn't rehearse it so um you're doing fine uh, that's that's why that's why you got the free um, exposure to my family before they left because uh, that wasn't rehearsed either. I had no idea. Um, in any case, um, Jeremiah, you're going to close out the um, the Zoom session, and then um, 
Um, it, that doesn't mean that we disconnect from any of you. Anybody wants to stick around and ask questions or make comments is welcome to do so. So, Jeremiah, 